morning, Mount Joy. How are you all doing? Talk to me. You doing all right? Good. I want you to burn at least eight calories. Stand up. Come on. At least a calorie. Come on. Let the glory.
tried Oh, all I want Is for you You to be glorified You to be lifted high All I want Is for you You to be glorified You to be lifted high Amen, amen. Let praises rise from the inside. I like that. But sometimes what's happening on the outside don't mean the same thing is going on on the inside. But worship is something that we do, not that we watch other people do. It's not the Olympics. In fact, they're not letting anybody in there this year. But our worship is what we do, and it has to begin on the inside. When we, when we, uh, uh, the Lord is worth a few calories. Amen. And uh, we don't always need to be as comfortable as we can be to worship. But praises ought to be rising from the inside. And, and as, as we seek God and bless God and, and honor God, worship happens. Amen. Yeah. But we're doing something for it to start happening. It, it won't happen on its own. We have to be lifting God up from the inside. Amen. We thank God for the selections, for that praise. And I think it's important that when we come into God's house or when we uh, come to the pet petition the throne of God, that we bring something, we ought to bring praise, we ought to bring honor, we ought to bring respect to God, we ought to, uh, we ought to make a sacrifice. Uh, they talk about the sacrifices of praise. It's, so many of us are so caught up in comfort that we don't get anything else done but comfort. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think the Lord is worth putting yourself out for yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Raise your hand a little bit. I mean, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bless them just, just a little bit. And let praises rise from the inside. And, 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 and God is a God of hearts. And if you, if, if you bless him with your heart, I believe he'll bless you right back. Amen. We thank God for this day. We thank God for blessing us to be here. We thank God for, uh, we got some rain last night, and we got, you know, so we, uh, it, it cooled it off a little bit. I'm not sure how long it's going to last, but we thank God for what we have and for uh, a chance to pick and choose a place to pray, uh, a chance to pick and choose a place to, to celebrate the sacrifices that God made for us. Uh, our special prayer list, Sister the the Lucille Yarbrough family, uh, Cornelius Bow lost his sister. They're in process of getting there now. Praying for Keith Williams, for Danny Bumpus, uh, Charlene Dozier, uh, for the Sharon, Car for Sharon Carpenter also, she's in the hospital. So we wanna pray for them and uh, we know we're not mentioning everyone, but we know God is able to bless even those we don't say by name. Uh, if you clear your heart of, of, of the other stuff, if you clear your mind of what happened yesterday and what you hope happens tomorrow, if you just, from the inside, in the military they say, listen up. And we ought to be listening up for God. And I'm not so much talking about what we say to him what does God have to say to us? How would God comfort us in our discomfort? How would God encourage us when we've been discouraged? Uh, how would God heal us when we're sick and down? But in order to, to receive that, we can't do all the talking. We have to open up and listen for God and know that God is not only able, but God is willing. Sometimes we have friends and family who, who are willing, but they're not able. Sometimes we have people that are able, but they're not willing. But God is willing and able. 
Isn't that great? God is willing and able. Father God, we come today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we come thanking you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us grace to just be here. And Father, we pray for our safety as we come, even as we go and go about our lives with what's happening in our world today. We thank you, Lord, for a peace of mind, for a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you, Lord, that uh, some of us have some aches and pains, but we're still able. And we thank you. We thank you, Father, for all the deliverance we've already received. Some of us have been sick, but we're well now. Some of us have been in trouble, dear Lord, but you've gotten us out. Some of us have been down, Lord, but you lifted us up. And Lord, I just thank you today. I, I thank you, Lord, that uh, our families are well. I thank you, Lord, that uh, what problems there are out there, dear Lord, we're trusting you with right now. We pray, Father, for those in our special prayer list. We pray for Sister Lucia Larbo's family. We pray for our brother Cornelius Bo and his family. We pray, Father, for my brother Keith and his family, that you would bless them, dear Lord, that you would bless doctors and to know what to do and how to do it. We pray for Danny Bumpus, that, that you would bless him, and Charlene Dozier, dear Lord, you, you know the situations. You know, Father, what we want. Father, you, you know what our, our will is. And we pray a blessing in Jesus' name. We pray for Sharon Carpenter. That you bless her through her surgery. And do Lord, all of those, uh, those here, Lord, and those who are streaming in here. You know our special needs, the needs, Father, that we didn't tell nobody else about. The problems, dear Lord, that we don't know how to begin to solve. But Lord, you got a blessing. And Father, we just seek you for that and we thank you for that. Father, show us how to worship. Show us how to pray, Lord. Bless your word today that your word might be a blessing to your people. We seek your face, Lord, and we know in you we find peace. We know, Lord, that in you we find joy and understanding. In you, Lord, we find courage for the journey. And we thank you for that. Bless this young lady as she stands forth, dear Lord, that you, uh, she's committed her life to you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just use her for your honor and your glory. We pray for our families, for our children, for our parents, all of those who are going through right now, and those who are about to start going through and don't know it yet. Bless them, we pray. And Father, there are special prayers that some of us have, Lord, and uh, special situations, Lord, that we don't have control over, Lord, but you are able to influence it. You're able to change hearts and change minds, fix things that are broken. We thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank God. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Okay, okay. The Lord woke us up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did he? Yes, okay. Well, then can we make a joyful praise unto the Lord for waking us up this morning? Yeah. Blessings. Yes, absolutely. What? Y'all, it is, it's not just Sunday. It's God's day, and every day is. And so um, thank you, Miss Lisa, always for how you lead us to usher in the spirit. Because y'all y'all know we gotta invite the spirit in, correct? Just waiting on the invitation. <laughs> Just waiting on you to be like, come in, sit with me, walk with me, lead me, guide me. And um, before I pray, and I thank you, Pastor Jackson, for your prayer and for your leadership, which we're gonna get into today, um, I just want to, uh, Give all honor to our leader, our heavenly father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, whom our leaders here at this church, Pastor Jackson and Miss Linda, they're ruled by our heavenly father. 
They give their life to Jesus Christ. They are led by the Holy Spirit. And that is amazing leadership. And I need everybody to stand up. <laughs> Y'all know if I'm up here, we're gonna do some interactive or something, just, just something, okay? Yeah. All right, um, I'm gonna name some things. And if you are none of those things, by the time I end, I need you to have a seat, okay? Okay. So if you're a believer, remain standing. Okay, oh yeah, we can clap to that, Tracy. Okay, okay let's go. And I hope you're standing um, at your homes, okay? Um, if you are a mother or a father, remain standing. So if you're a believer, you should stay standing. So if you're not one, then you could have a seat. But if you happen to be a mother or a father um, or a pastor or a teacher or a nurse um, or a musician uh, or own your own business, how many people own their own businesses? Ooh, okay, yeah, <laughs> I had to do that one. Yes, Miss Sheila, okay. Um, you're a, a, a son or a daughter, a grandparent, a grandmother. Yeah, y'all can get it for anything that you're associated with. Feel free to make some noise because it's a blessing. Yeah. It is an entire blessing. If you are someone that has charge over um, other beings, an entity, a church, a school, a platoon. Yeah, everybody is still standing, correct? So in my opinion, what you are saying by remaining standing is that the Lord has given you favor and leadership. Simple as that. If you're standing, the Lord has given you favor in leadership. So this message is for you if you are standing. So please have a seat so we can get into the message. Okay. So we're just going to go before the Lord um, again. Dear Lord, we just thank you for how amazing you are, how sweet you are, dear Lord, but also just how powerful you are, Lord. We thank you for all the sides of you, dear Lord, and the fact that we get to be image bearers of that. Dear Lord, I thank you for your message that, is, that has tore my soul up, Lord, and I just thank you for uh, Miss Kathy in the back, Lord, and her patience with me, <laughs> dear Lord, for the message changing and you presenting today what needs to be told. Lord, I pray that I die to myself right here and right now, that it be your spirit and your message that shine through and not my flesh. We love you, Lord. I pray for receptive hearts, Lord, that our hearts are open to receive what you have to say, that we die to any distraction that could be in our way, Lord. Whatever's going to happen after church can wait, Lord. Whatever is sounding off in our homes or in our minds, Lord, I pray for silence that we are able to receive you and you only at this time. We ask these things through the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. All right, so today we're talking about the importance of consistent leadership. So not just leadership, because you all recognize that you're all leaders. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. So I am gonna ask as leaders, um, we have to be the ones always willing to learn. So if you could get out a pen and a paper, if you could get out your cell phone and go to your notes section, I am gonna ask today that we lead by learning. <laughs> okay, so I am gonna ask that, so I will give you some time. Um, to get that out, but the best thing I've learned in life, my mother is an educator, and I mean, she is one of the greatest learners I know. She always has a pen and paper. She, her calendar is filled with everything, not just with her to-dos, but what she's learned. People that are talking, people that um, she gets to do life with that she's learning lessons from. She takes notes of all those things, and because of her, I got like 18,000 journals. I'm exaggerating, but I have at least 18. Um, and uh, taking notes has saved me. Because when I'm writing those things down, I'm able to recall later in my life something that I've written down. You know, it's a great way of learning. So young folks, if you're trying to study for exams or all of us, if we're trying to prepare for something, a speech, or to uh, give a talk or to study for a class, because you could be any age and be in school, blessings, because we're always learners, write it down. The Lord said write the vision down and make it plain, right? We in Proverbs, okay? So let's write it down. So today I hope I give you some good things. I'm not gonna lie to you, I was inspired by Sunday school uh, from the book of Nehemiah. And if you are not joining Sunday school, I didn't join today because the Lord was putting some of the things on my heart. Um, but if you are not a part of Sunday school, I'm gonna invite you into that space as well. Um, it is outstanding. You wanna be a learner? Because we're all leaders. And to be a leader, you also need to be a learner. I'm gonna invite you to Sunday school. It's powerful, it's deep and dope. That's what I like to say. And um, I got to sit with uh, Deacon Pitts, and he's so funny. He's, he's amazing. And I mean, we just tore up Nehemiah, and so we're going to tear it up together today. Um, so that's why I need your notes out. And we're going to be coming from chapters 1 through 4. Not all the verses, y'all. Not all of them, okay? So don't worry. I'm not going to bore you to death. I think it's going to be kind of fun, actually, because we're going to follow this little rhythm today. And I want you to write this down. I want you to write down prayer, period, care, C-A-R-E, period, 
And then um, I hope they're next to each other. If you have them underneath each other, I want you to put like a little arrow connecting them because those two are interchangeable, okay? And then the third word is rinse, like you rinsing something off, period, repeat, period. Those are our four words. We're going to be going through that segment multiple times. Prayer, care, rinse, repeat. If that was on a t-shirt, you would see prayer, care, little arrow, rinse, repeat. Because, you know, we're killing it with these t-shirts nowadays. If you were in the t-shirt game, you are killing it. So this is how we're going to begin. How many of us are leaders in the room? Make some noise. Amen, amen, amen. Yes, yes, we all are. And so um, I want to dive into uh, who Nehemiah is, and I want to say this at the beginning, and I'm going to say this at the end. We are the Nehemiah of our lifetime. Uh, we are the Nehemiah of our lifetime. Um, and I didn't know much about Nehemiah, okay? He comes after Ezra before Esther in the Old Testament. So if you don't know, now you know, Okay. After Ezra, before Esther, we all know who Esther is, queen, okay, she did that thing. But before that, there's Nehemiah. So let's dive into it. If you want to go with me, we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2. And um, next to that, if you want to take notes, put, just put care, and you could put a circle around it, however you want to do it. But I want to show you the progression of leadership. And then we're going to talk about the importance of being a consistent leader, because nothing can get done the way God called us to without consistency. I can't just show up one time and think it's gonna be there. No, 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 it takes consistency and we're gonna look at the leadership and the propositions of Nehemiah on how we are to do this, okay? So in Nehemiah chapter one, verses two, um, in the NKJV version, it says, I asked them, now he's referring to, um, if you would like, you know what, I'm gonna read the verse, EJ, I, I feel you can go ahead and stand. You can go ahead and stand, I, I like that. If you like to stand for the reading of the word, feel free. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 2, it says, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived uh, the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Blessings. You guys can have a seat. I'm going to explain this really quick. So I'm going to be doing some explaining. I'm going to have some verses for you, and I'm going to be doing some explaining. So that's why it's essential for you to have a pen in your hand and or use your finger to type it into your phone. So Nehemiah is a cupbearer for the king of Persia, okay, a high position. Um, we, he, he, he had the opportunity to hear from uh, Jewish delegates that came to the kingdom, okay? So he is taking in the information. He's asking about his people. How are they? Because what has happened, you all, what he's going to find out is that the wall, the boundary that protects Jerusalem has been damaged and broken and completely knocked down, all right? So I just kind of want to set the scene. So when he said, I asked them, he is showing concern for his people. He is showing care. So as leaders, we have got to show care, you all. We've got to be asking the right questions, okay? We've got to have them on our mind. If you're a parent, you're going to have your children on your mind. For most people, like, duh. No, but I mean, like, intentionally. Not just what you want to know about them, but the situation in general before we come up with our own defense mechanisms or this and that. So he said, I asked them concerning the Jews, concerning his people. He had concern, he had compassion, he had empathy towards his people who had been, who had escaped. So they were in captivity, you all. We're talking about, let's talk about our homes. Let's bring this relevant to us here today. Okay, so he's asking about his family. Let's say that he was down in Tennessee, because that's where I'm from, so I like to use Tennessee a lot. But he was down in Tennessee, okay, serving a governor there. And he's asking about his family here in Edwardsville. How was Mount Joy? Okay. And he heard from some of the deacons that were possibly traveling. So let's say Deacon Pitts. And Deacon Pitts is like, listen, man, the walls of the church have been broken. We, they don't have a safe place to be. There is no boundary protecting them from the outside world or from those trying to hurt them. If we want to get more personal, okay, it's your grandfather. Call in your father. How is the family? Look, Dad, we lost everything. We have nothing protecting us that we're able to go to and have a safe haven. So this is the message that Nehemiah was receiving about his people. He was in a position of responsibility and of honor. He was checking on those that God had given him to, be, to have leadership over you all. So he's checking up on them. All right? So he's checking. He's at, you know, the people that had escaped, those who had survived the captivity. All right? So he, he knows what's happening. Okay? He knows where they're at. 
So they were in some captivity. He's asked about their whereabouts. He's asking about their well-being. He sought understanding of their current situation. So he wasn't like, okay, how was, how was, how was Jim? As you know, he, you know, he struggles. That was 10 years ago Jim struggled in school. You know, now we are today and Jim is in, at, you know, out of college and doing his thing. We have got to be asking about the current situation. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? I know I'm talking fast, but I told you today's gonna be a day of learning. Like Nehemiah broke us off and we gotta dive into it. So I'm looking at my girl Christina out here, right? One year college down, she said, oh my God, I'm nervous, tell it, yeah, yeah, let's go. So when we call about Christina, we're not calling about the Christina that we knew back in middle school. We calling about the Christina that's currently in college right now, that has pledged AKA, that's doing her thing. Am I correct or, or am I not correct? She said, yes, you better make some noise, okay, in the church, absolutely. So when we check up on Christina, when Christina checks up on Courtney, who is now in high school doing her thing, we're checking up on her current situation and her well-being, not with preconceived notions of the past, but of who they are and where they are today. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. It's imperative, you all. It's imperative to be leaders that we've got to be up on the current situation and to seek understanding from people that would know. So uh, uh, my guy Nehemiah was talking to the delegates. They should know. And he trusted what they had to say without inference, okay? And to me, this is a big deal. Um, he listened to wise counsel on the well-being of his people, which was excellent. And then he listened without defense. You didn't see that Nehemiah had preconceived notions in this. All we know is that he took in what was said, and we're going to be able to tell by his reaction. And this was his reaction. So if you were to go down to uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4, it says, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. Hmm. I was fasting and praying before God in heaven. So this is how I know there were no preconceived notions because he took it and it hit him. He didn't already have a mindset of what would be. He had an idea, obviously, of what they had been through. So I'm not saying forget what we've been through or where we were, but he took in the moment of where every, all of his people were at. And his first response was to have a seat. And oftentimes when we lower ourselves, we're in a position of humility. Are y'all with me? So as leaders, we have to be willing to take a position of humility. It's not about me lording myself over anyone. I have the opportunity, the Lord's given me this opportunity since June 14th, 2020, to run my own business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But man, the, the humble position I have to be in on the daily to receive what God has to say, but also to serve the people God's called me to serve, it's astronomical. I feel like every day I'm taking many seats. I know y'all heard of that. Take many seats. And oftentimes we're saying that like, okay. <laughs> but no, I'm saying that for real. Take a seat. When he took a seat, it put him in this position you are to take in the gravity of what his people were going through. And his response is he wept. And that's not just crying, that's not just a tear here and there, that's not the, the tear emoji that we say, oh man, I'm crying. No, that's like whole body, like I felt that. Like I'm, it says it, he mourned. Y'all, that's like the deepest grievance. Like this is the level of care. I'm still talking about care, we still on point one, we're still on care. This is the level of care that Nehemiah has for his people that he's checking up on. He's not there with them, seeing them every day. He's checking up on them because sometimes you just got to check up on people. You, if, if God puts someone on your heart to call them, call them. I'm telling you, that'd be the, that, that's the time. They need you. And then to go there and listen without defense so you can take in their current situation and that emotion. Because you might be rejoicing with them, but you also, excuse me, might be mourning with them. And are we available to mourn with each other and to rejoice with each other without our own issues taking away our opportunity to lead and serve? We're going to get there. Right? Y'all with me. I feel it. I see notes being taken. We going. So um, I had to, when I first read through Nehemiah a week or so ago, two weeks ago, what hit me about his response was this is the necessary response. This should be the response. When someone comes to you with something or you notice something or you're checking up on somebody, our response should be a response of love. And that's what his was. I have to be willing to sacrifice and love someone to weep and rejoice with them. So as leaders, which is all of us in this room, we are called to respond in love no matter what it is. Y'all going to see in the prayer that he's about to break it down. He's about to bring up the past and where they've come from. And they failed multiple times. 
And I want to add this, and as we go, I mean, we're on the third time that this wall has been broken down, you all. This is after the Jews acted a fool, okay, and couldn't get out the wilderness because they kept serving other gods. Like, these are the same people that he's weeping over, that he responds to in love. So sometimes we're going to hear some things that we don't want to hear. You did what? That's not how I raised you. You know, there's some things that have come to our mind, right? This is not what I taught you. I gave you deliberate <laughs> instructions, and you did this, 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 and the third. What are we doing, okay? I trust you with my friendship, and this is what you're doing. Like, we could go down the line, but in Nehemiah's response, it was in love. He wept, already knowing that, okay, you know, this is a bad situation, but that's not his first response. His first response is in empathy and in love which is profound. And I want to check this too. He said, I was fasting and praying before God in heaven. Now that's not a part of my message, but dear John, some things can only be fixed through fasting and praying. Some things are so deep and so heavy that we are called to fast. So we are called to separate ourselves from earthly things and be at God's feet for him to answer that prayer, for him to work in a miraculous way. And when I tell you that sometimes you're going to do that for you and you're going to do that for others, Nehemiah is an example of this right here, fasting and praying. And if we don't know about it, let's learn about it and let's be about it as a church family because fasting and praying moves mountains. Some of those unmovable mountains and things that we go through year in and year out, some of those addictions, some of those, I'm just saying, they only will be resolved through fasting and praying. So I wanted to note that in fasting and praying, not just fasting to lose weight, that's a diet. That's a diet. I want to be clear because we be like, oh, I'm doing a Daniel fast. Yeah. I'm, I, I, but three years ago, I'm doing the Daniel fast. My only thought was how much weight I was losing. Mm-hmm. What are, that's not fat. No, excuse me. Right. Well, that might be some worldly fasting, but we're talking about what God designed fasting for. That's for us to be at his feet. It ain't about how I look, mm-hmm. right? It's about the position that I'm in at his feet for God to be called on to do miraculous things. Can I get an amen on that? So then he moves into this next section. So if we had a t-shirt and we had care and we had prayer next, which are interchangeable, he went to his heavenly father in prayer, okay? So if you move down to chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, um, I'm calling it the covering. He covered his people. And I'm going to give you a little bit of time. I'm serious. We're learning a lot today. So you have your Bibles or you have the Holy Bible app on your phone. I want you to open I want you to open it up right here right now. Whatever version that you have, we're in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. I want you to read that prayer. Read that prayer. You reading the prayer, Iman? <laughs> hey, baby girl. As you're reading it, the first thing that Nehemiah does, he acknowledges the bigness of God. Y'all, it's giving us steps right here. He acknowledges the bigness of God. God, you are awesome. Y'all are reading it, so I know you know what it says. And he acknowledges this moment, how pivotal this moment. And remember, he humbled himself. He took a seat. He's weeping. He's fasting. And he is praying. And his prayer acknowledges God and his bigness. It acknowledges this, um, this huge moment. And then he remembers God's promises and conditions within that very same prayer. He's like, God, I know what you said. And I also know that you said for those who believe, because this is key. God's promises are for those who believe. So I've got to believe. And if I'm not praying for the people that I have the opportunity to lead, including myself, for their salvation, then you all, I am not upholding God's promises, my end of the bargain. It's for those who believe. Do y'all see that in the prayer? Okay, just make sure, you know, I ain't, you know, okay. So I got witnesses that it says for those who believe. So let's make sure that in all of our getting, we're getting the word and we're sharing the word. And that we're doing life with people to the point that they see Jesus in you. Yeah, and they understand who Jesus is. And that then eventually at some point they have, the Lord has allowed you to plant seeds and other people to water them seeds. That they are serving the same God that you're serving. Because then you all, they will also receive the promise. This is deep and this is real life. And this is for all ages and stages. I get to sit with Zane a few times a month, my guy, five years old. And when I tell you he's ready to pray, I'm like, come on, other five-year-olds. Here's an example right here, right now. This is, this is, this is Jesus working through a five-year-old. But those seeds were planted by his mother, Tracy, and by his grandparents, and by his church family. Y'all, this is a powerful thing. And these promises don't come to those who don't believe. They come to those who do. So our heart must break for that. 
Um, and I loved it too, because in the beginning of these prayers, all of his prayer was bigger than his personal wants. Nehemiah could have been, Lord, just, I just need you to save my people, <laughs> okay? I just need you to tell me what to do. No, he came first to the bigness of God, to the bigness of the moment, remembering who God is and his promises and what God said, how he said it. To lead you all, we gotta be steadfast to God's word. We gotta be steadfast to what he's told you. It's not time for us to take the vision and twist it and turn it on how we want to. We gotta hold on to the way God gave it to us and then walk in that to be leaders. Y'all, there's a whole bunch of false teachers. There's a whole bunch of things happening that's not aligning itself with God's will or word. And that can't be us. And let me not say it like that. God's called us the truth. So let's live it, right? Yeah. It's all in how you look at it. So let's keep going. I said it's going to be a day of learning, okay? So we're going to keep rolling on through here. Um, he gets to these expressions. Um, uh, he expresses a humble state in the sin. We're still looking at the prayer because, y'all, all things must start with prayer. I'm pretty doggone sure Nehemiah was praying about his people before the delegates came and gave him update because they were on his mind. When I think of Paul and I get to Philippians chapter one, he's like, man, every time I think of you, I thank God for you. He's praying thankfulness unto God for the people. And I have the same heart for Nehemiah. I mean, they, if they weren't on his mind, he wasn't praying. How could he have such level of care? So how are you praying for yourself and the people that you are leading? How are you covering them? How are you praying for them? Because in prayer, we get care. But let's keep going. I love it how he confesses the sin of the past and of the current and how it wasn't them. It was a we mentality. We sinned, my forefathers and myself. So as a leader, it's not them, oh, they did this. You know, I, I, I shared that with Miss Sheila and she said that. As a leader, we must take responsibility as well. Responsibility is key. You cannot have leadership without responsibility. And if we're leading with a them versus I mentality, y'all, we are not leading, we're a hot mess. Because that ain't Jesus' example. We, I came so that, that we will be free, you all. Like, it is a we mentality that we, that we must have yeah. as believers, yeah. that we must have as leaders, that we must have as followers. What if Jesus came down and was like, man, they didn't do anything I said. I'm not saving them. They're fallen people. I gave them all this and that. I'm literally doing miracles. What if he decided right before he got on the cross not to do it because he was like, no, they didn't do what I said do. Hmm. What if he had that attitude? Come on, think about that, y'all. <laughs> That's a powerful moment. But instead, just like, no, I love, his response was love. And he believed even when we were sinning. And we must believe, you all. We must believe even when that child still has an addiction. We must believe even when the business looks like it's going this way and not this way. We must believe and be leaders that hold on to the faith and hold on to God's word and the vision that he gave us. And take responsibility for what we are doing, where we are at, and where we are going. So if we're not there yet, there's still work to be done. There's still opportunity for me to learn as a leader. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? I'm talking a lot, but we're going to keep on going. Um, and then he acknowledges whom the people belong to, who the power belongs to, and who will be doing the prospering, and that's God. So the very people that he's praying over, that he's concerned about, that he wept for, he acknowledges that these are God's people. Yeah. So the very children that you have, the very parents that you serve, those are God's people. Y'all, that's a powerful thing to remember. So number one, if they're God's people, you, if you're serving God, then you will serve them because you have a heart of service to serve God. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. If it's God's people, now that also takes the burden off your back to fix it. Y'all with me? If it's God's people, if it's God's situation, if it's God's anything, then I have all that I need. And I'm equipped with everything possible to lead the situation the way God's called me to. So it puts everything back into perspective. It's not for me to fix it, but it's also not for me to, to not take responsibility. It's for me to take responsibility and hand it all back over to Jesus and align myself with him. Because he will fix it. And we're going to get there because he will fight on our behalf. I love it. And God has the power. And we have the power within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God is going to do the prospering. The prospering belongs to God. The success, the achievement that we will have is according to God's will. And God's timing and God's vision. 
It will be if we believe. Remember, this is for leaders. These are for believers. And we must have that type of position that Nehemiah took in his prayer. Um, Y'all still with me? Okay. God's people, through God's power, prayer for God to prosper this situation. Okay, now we're gonna get to this really fun part, okay? So the whole rinsing, the God gave me this vision. I was gonna come here with this like bucket and this towel, a little dye on it, and show you when you dip it in the bucket one time that the dye doesn't really go anywhere. But you gotta rinse it multiple times. You can some scrub it in there and do some work in there. Look at it again, you know, maybe survey it, dip it back in there and keep getting that work in there. But I didn't do all that because Pastor Jackson has me up here. <laughs> okay, didn't wanna get water everywhere. But most importantly, I got too much to talk about. So what, this is what we're gonna do. I want you to have that image in your mind, but I want you to write down rinse. You can circle it, put a star around it, do whatever you want. And I want next to it, in parentheses, I want you to put work. I want you to put work. Okay? And then next to that, I want you to put faith in action. Hey, hey, hey. Okay? All right? So back in the day, we was washing them clothes. They was working. They was getting it. They were doing that thing. And this is our work. Okay? I'm going to give you uh, four Ps that we're going to follow through, and we're going to just keep going through these four Ps. I'm going to show you the example of Nehemiah on how he did his rinsing, okay? So prayer, which we already talked about here at the beginning, okay? Permission is the, is the second P. So if you're taking notes, write it on down, okay? So we got prayer is the first P. Permission is the second P. This is important. You're going to see it. Provision, which we're going to talk about, is the supplying um, of a need, okay? So we have prayer is number one. Permission is number two. Provision is number three, and preparation is number four. Okay, so repeat after me, prayer, prayer. permission, permission. Provision. provision, and preparation. And we're rinsing, okay? So we work, we work, we're working. So we're going to go to chapter two, and this is what we're going to do. Um, from chapter two to chapter four, there's like four breakdowns of this rinse and repeat. This rinse and repeat, okay? This rinse and repeat. So I'm going to give you some verses sometimes, but really what I'm going to invite you to do is study the book of Nehemiah, in particular chapters 1 through 6, even though we're focusing on chapters 1 through 4. I'm going to invite you into that space. It's a beautiful thing to read God's word for yourself. And let's talk about it. So in chapter 2, the very beginning of chapter 2, there's a, there's a prayer, permission, provision, preparation I want to take us through. And I would love for you to take notes as you're reading if you would like. So... Um, Hmm. we already heard the prayer that Nehemiah gave, the end of chapter one, okay? And uh, I, I just, again, want to remind us that he responded in prayer, okay, to God, all right? He said, let our servants prosper. That was his prayer. The permission he got was this, okay? So I'm going to tell the story while you're reading the story. Um, Nehemiah first got permission from God, and then he got permission from the king to go and do. So he got permission from God to act, so sometimes situations come at hand and we need to ask, and it's for me to go or for me not to go, okay? We can use Paul for an example. Sometimes he was literally in chains and he couldn't go, so he wrote a letter, okay? Wow. So there was different ways that he responded, but he got the permission to do it, all right? Um, and then he got permission from the king. So as I told you, Nehemiah um, was the cupbearer for the king. Y'all with me? Yeah. So he, there was an order, there was a pecking order there. He had leadership over him. So it's amazing how that works. You're leading people. You're leading yourself and leading others, and somebody's leading you. Okay? God is leading us, but you probably have somebody on this earth that's leading you. We have, we have a, a pastor here that is leading us. Okay? There's certain things we need to get permission for that we need to seek wisdom from, from our leadership. And so Nehemiah did that. I'm going to roll through these because I see my time. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and so he got permission from the king to go and, and, and be about his business that God called him to. And guess what? God gave him favor because it, it was aligned with God's will, and the king said, go. With, with favor, you all, with favor. Yeah. So I'm going to go, I'm roll through this because I'm going to invite you to read it. But then he got provision, and provision is a, is a supplying of a need, okay? So he asked for, I'm calling them security letters, all right? So he was going to be traveling through land where he had enemies, okay? Okay? Traveling through land where he had enemies. Some of us got enemies, okay? Some of us know that to get to the president, I got to go through the vice president who don't like me. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all ain't been through that. Um, you know, I mean, some of us are on city councils and on uh, school boards, and sometimes there's people that don't get along. And sometimes we need security letters. Sometimes we need, we need like, look, this is what I got. This is, this is what I have to solidify what I'm, uh, what, why I'm here and why this is important on what I have to say. Okay? So it's okay. Some of y'all are with me. Some of y'all not. That's okay. But he got security letters to make sure he could get through those towns and, and, and lands that he had enemies that would probably look to take his life. And then he got timber 
for the beams to build up the city wall. Remember, now I know we talk a lot about leadership and everything, but remember Nehemiah's goal. His people were in danger. The wall had been knocked down for the third time. For the third time, okay? So, I mean, past experience, I think he knew that he needed timber to build up the beams for the wall, all right? And so he asked for something that, would, that he knew the king could provide. Mm -hmm. And guess what? God gave him favor. The king provided it. So he asked for things that he needed, not for things that he wanted. So he didn't also ask for 18,000 shekels, okay, uh, to make sure that he stayed at all the nice restaurants and, or ate at the nice restaurants, did this and that. He asked for what he needed because he knew that God would provide the rest. Are y'all with me? Yeah. He asked for what he needed. It wasn't about him. It was about what God had called him to. It was greater than him. And then the preparation. So this was powerful. This was powerful to me. And me and Mr. Pitts, just, we just died when we, were, when we put this together. Um, so he traveled. The letters got him through you all. He has arrived in Jerusalem. Ooh, ooh, he's at his destination. How many of us get to our destination but sometimes lose sight of the goal? He didn't lose sight of the goal. Because when he got there, he surveyed. He took in the damage. He remembered why he was there, and he rested first for three days, and then he surveyed all of it over a night span. Y'all, he went to the top. There were things he was trying to climb on, and he couldn't because there's so much rubbish and so much damage. He didn't just go there on day one and be like, this is what we're going to do. He didn't just show up when my child called for help and just tell them what to do. He took in the damage. He took in, yes, he took in and surveyed the atrocity, the, the problem the hurt, the pain. He took in the walls that had been broken down that left vulnerability. He took it in first before trying to seek a solution. So if that's not a life lesson in itself, we are not called just to fix. Are y'all with me? Remember, God's the fixer. So I'm not getting a phone call to be like, well, you need to go this here, 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 and here. I can for sure share wisdom, but did I take in the situation first? Did I hear them out first? Did I hear the hurt and the pain? Could they explain the whole situation before I tried to fix them? Uh -huh. Are y'all with me? Oh, yeah. I just, this got me as a human being, as a leader, it got me in every single way of my life. I was like, dear God, I jumped to conclusions so quick, trying to fix, trying to do this, trying to do that. Listen, Anya, sit down, take a seat and listen. Yeah. So then I can allow God to fix it and respond and ask him how I am to be a part of the solution. Forward moving, people. Okay, here we go. Um, he kept God's vision to himself, which was important as well. God may have given you something, and as leaders, we have to know the timing on when that is to be presented. Maybe it's not at the beginning. If I'm coming and crying to you about something, maybe it's not for you to tell me, well, God's going to do this and do that. Maybe it's just for you to listen during that time, and that's what he did, you guys, while he was surveying the damages. But then, but then, we get to the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3, and it's on and popping. We're at our next rinse. Okay, the next rinse. And I'm going to make this quick because I see how the time is going. When he wakes up the next morning after he surveyed all the damage, okay, the walls are still down. We ain't picked up one rubble, you guys. He just has taken it in. The next day, he gets per Okay, so this is, this is where I'm saying that these four Ps can kind of go in whatever order. It's, it's a working thing. He gets permission from the Jews to build. He asks them, hey. Can I get, you know, this is what we're about to do. Are we in here for it, okay? And he does that by expressing God's vision then after he surveyed what was happening. And then he empowered the people to the point that they set their hands to the good work. So he took it all in, you all. And then after he took it in, he sought the Lord. He got permission from them to build. And because he got their permission, their consent, they were willing to do it. They were willing. And not only were they willing, they set their minds to it. it you, nothing can deter a made-up mind. Like, it's set. So now it's like, it, it's almost like Nehemiah was like, this is your idea. <laughs> to the point, like, like, let's build. And when you get people aligned with something that they feel like they're a part of, it's a wrap. It's a wrap, you all. Yeah. And now as a leader, all we have to do is equip and contribute and help lead them in their gifting. It becomes so much simple. But when we get to trying to force people to do stuff, it don't work out in our favor. So let's just keep rolling through this. Um, I, I like to put that he became an inspirational leader because he began to equip all the leaders. If you continue to read, so now we're in chapter 3. All of chapter 3 describes how each person got up and they started building. And it gives positions for a reason. The first people to stand up were the priest. So he created space in a culture for other leaders to have space to lead. It doesn't say that in the Bible like that, but the first people it mentions are the priests. 
that were heading that area, you all, when Nehemiah wasn't there. Y'all with me? And they were the first ones that felt the opportunity that they had to lead to use their gifting. And it was pretty powerful. I had, I'm telling you, it's a lot of stuff, and I know I got to keep going. Um, but they, there was also provision happening at the same time. So we're at our next rinse and repeat, right? So I, what I didn't tell you is they had enemies. So the same lands he had to run through, they were mocking them. They're like, this is the third time they can't build that wall. They don't have the ability to do this and that. You're not made for this. You can't do, you have this disability, you have this issue, you were raised without a father, you don't have the resources necessary, you didn't come from this cloth, you're not this, you're not that. They had all this mockery happening around them, contradicting what God already told them. But remember the promises, these are the Jews, they are the promised people. They got promises all up on their life, but they have people going against it. But Nehemiah's leadership instilled an opportunity for provision of faith. Okay, so when they were hearing this, if you continue to read in chapter, chapter 3, Nehemiah stood and said, no, God promised, so it will be. And so what he provided for his people at that point was faith, was faith. And sometimes we just need a good word. After you listen to me and you hear me and you see that the wall has been broken down three times in my life, I'm on my second marriage possibly, or, you know, I'm trying to do this. I haven't been able to have children like eight times now. Like, it is failing. Sometimes we just need somebody to stand with us and have faith. I'm in school, I can't get right in math. <laughs> you know, I, I need somebody to stand alongside me that has faith. Yeah. And so he provided that for them, which instilled them to keep going, you all. And the preparation was this, and this is what I loved, okay? So Nehemiah coordinated, and he led by showing up every day. Here's the consistency part. So guess what, you all? He was a great leader so far, right? He's got permission from God. He's here. We started building, but the wall ain't finished yet. But we're going to get to the end of the wall which is in chapter, the end of chapter five, because Nehemiah shows up every day. He's at that wall every single day. How can you not follow somebody that's living it out every day? Not saying he was perfect, but he showed up how many times? How many times? Every day he was at the wall. That's the only way we get this account. Y'all, this account is written by Nehemiah. He was at the wall to tell you the priest stood up and then the nobles of Jericho and blah, or whoever, blah, 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 blah. He's the one telling us. He's recounting this because he was there. Yeah. He couldn't recount it if he was not there, you all. Yeah. He showed up. He led. And then this is, like I said, he coordinated things, all right? So they started out with the sheep gates. And the sheep gates is the main entrance into the into the. Uh, the territory. So if you can't start with the, the entrance and the exit, we can't start out here with these walls when people can just enter and attack us anytime. So he coordinated a great plan. We're going to start with how we enter and how we exit. So that way we can protect it. So he had a plan, you guys. He coordinated people. He put them where they needed to go. And then he equipped them and he built them up. So powerful. I'm about to run over time. So um, I'm going to just keep going. Like I said, he, okay, he equipped the leaders and he gave space for others to lead. We already talked about that. Um, he worked with Diligence, hence the peoples. You see, our followers will mimic our work ethic. They will mimic what we show. So if Nehemiah wasn't working, do you think the people would be working? Remember, this is the third time the wall has fell. I would not, I mean, think about it. Oh, this is the third time. Like, uh, like, I need somebody to give me some hope. <laughs> he was there every day. He had to be, like, uh, the leadership's reflection is greatest among its followers. I was told this as a college athlete. I was a cap made captain in the middle of my freshman year for the women's basketball team at Wisconsin, right? And by my senior year, I realized that my captainship ain't solidified until after I leave and I see how they lead themselves. The people that I just led for three and a half years, how will they continue? Now that showed my leadership, not just when I was there and able to talk to them and direct them because they were following me. My leadership was solidified once I left because now they are either gonna live it out or I didn't do my job and they were gonna fail. Does that make sense? It was more evident in that. And so, so now he's going down the wall. So he's not just here, but the, you're going to know in chapter five, the wall gets built. So people followed his lead and they did, they did what they were called to do. And y'all, he empowered them and equipped them. I'm going to keep going. Okay. And then don't forget this. Remember, these are God's people and Nehemiah is a man of God. So they consecrated and they sanctified everything that they did. The first of everything. So that first building, oh, they sanctified all them bricks, y'all, all the more, whatever they use. I don't, I don't have all that for you. Um, but they sanctified it in Jesus name. It was set aside, especially for, especially for God. 
their first. So we can get into tithes and offering y'all, but it was their first. And that was given back to God. And everything they did was in service of God and God's glory. And it was powerful. And it was powerful, you all. I really hope that you read it. Um, last but not least, this, this, this hit me as well. Um, he gave purpose to each person's work because remember that we're one body. So I mentioned the priests, they were the ones up first, but I mean, y'all, we get down to the smallest of people, the ones without titles. And guess what? They built, they did their portion and all of it was important. So if you're leading a family, you got four kids like my parents did, the oldest ain't the most important, neither is the youngest. Each and every one of their giftings and who they are are as important as the next person. Some of us may be paying professionally or some of us may be getting master degrees, whatever it is, or some of us may just be working a job every day. I'm giving you my family's breakdown, but ain't one of those more important than the other. And he instilled that in his people. So it didn't matter if you were the carpenter or you were the priest. The, your portion of the wall was important because what did it do? It built the whole wall because we're one body. So like this church, it doesn't matter if you're the one greeting here or you're the pastor standing up here. Your role is important because we are one body and we are God's body and, and one kingdom. Are y'all with me? And so, okay, okay, I know, again, like I said, I'm talking too much. I know it's because I'm sweating too. So um, he gave them all purpose. And then I love this. It was a, a physical building that it was also building an intangible spiritual mindset, okay? So they're building this wall, you all, right? Every day they're building this wall, but they're also building their spiritual stamina. Every day, every day, every brick that was laid was, a, was another strong morsel of faith that was being built. Every single day, it's a, it was a, to me a great analogy of what it looks like to be building up the kingdom of God. We have a physical building right here, but what we're building, you all, is the, <laughs> are y'all with me? It's the faith that we're implanting other people's lives and what we are living out each and every day. We are God's kingdom. We are that wall. Yes, the spiritual stamina is pretty dope. Okay, I got to keep going. We're coming to the end. Um, yep, yep. I know y'all hear me, but then y'all going to be like, you know, <laughs> later, okay? So um, we get to the end of chapter four. I'm going to give you one more rinse and go. Um, or excuse me, the beginning of chapter four is so verses three through nine. And um, another rinse and go, we're going to go prayer, permission, provision, preparation, then we're going to end this bad boy, all right? So they had, the attacks got even more severe, you all. They got half the wall built. Half the wall is built, okay? So all the naysayers, they're like, oh, if a fox jumped on the wall, it would cr crumble down. They were talking trash back in the day, okay? Um, now we have physical threats. They are conspiring to take out Nehemiah physically. So now it has moved from words to physical action. And so Nehemiah's response was prayer first. And he said, hear, oh God. And he went in on this prayer, you all. He went in on this prayer because now, because he's aligned with God, he understands that any attack against him or his was a mockery and attack against God. Simple as that. So you're going to come for me, you're coming for God. Y'all with me? If you're going to come for me, you're coming for God. Because God's got me and he fights for me. So come on with it, because the God that I serve is greater than any of your attacks, yeah, yeah. right? And so that was um, pretty cool, because in his prayer, he also got permission. <laughs> he got permission for God to vindicate himself. He's like, God, go do your thing, because they're coming against you. They think they're coming against me, but they're coming against you. So Lord, we open up this opportunity to give you permission to go vindicate thyself, okay? Bring your wrath upon your enemies for coming at you. So remember, this is bigger than me. If I had came to the church to fix the church myself, if some naysayers did something to me, it is personal because I did that on my own will outside of God's. But if I come because God's called me to and I got God's permission, I stand before you and somebody got something to say, they're coming against God. So that's not going to keep me up at night. They're going to be added to my prayer list. You understand? And I'm going to do what I need to do physically to protect myself and my people, which you're going to see him do that. But you coming against God. And we should have power in that, you all. And you should be able to say that stronger than what you say you coming against the Covingtons or you coming against Mount Joy. No, you coming against God. So come on with it. And let me stop now because we ain't inciting war, but we just saying, if you want some, come get some. Anyway, <laughs> provision. <laughs> all right, okay. So the provision that was given was perseverance. All right, so they're at it, you guys, multiple days. We're only got the wall halfway built, all right? But he gave them, he was giving the people uh, perseverance. Perseverance. Y'all waving at me or what's happening? <laughs> yeah, y'all. Okay, hey, babies. <laughs> Christina, Courtney back here. Okay, they gave him perseverance to keep going. I got y'all. I, I get what y'all saying. It's time. I got you. 
He gave them perseverance, you all, to push through this time. So remember, this is the third time the wall's been broken. They sitting here only halfway through. They're getting mocked, and now their leader and them, they are surrounded. I forgot to tell you about this. They're surrounded at this point. Every, every uh, sheep gate they put up, every entrance is surrounded by enemies. Who would quit? Who would quit? If I was by myself and I thought I was in this by myself, maybe. But when I'm walking with God and I have a leader, and I have a leader that's reminding me of the power of God. Like he prayed in vindication, not in fear of the people that were surrounding them. Like literally y'all people are coming at Nehemiah's life, but also all the Jews. And remember, this is the third time. So they've already experienced attacks in captivity multiple times. Y'all with me? Like they've experienced some things. This is the third time we had to build it up. And this is how they prepared. So again, we have the prayer, oh, hear, oh God, go vindicate thyself. He gave God permission to come down and <laughs> take out those people that were going against him. And then the provision that was given was the perseverance to keep pushing, keep fighting. He encouraged his people. He equipped them with, with the words and faith necessary to keep pushing. And then the preparation came in this. He had them pray day and night. The Jews prayed day and night. They came together and they prayed day and night against the conspiracy of confusion and the planned physical attacks that are coming their way. Satan wants to still kill and destroy, and I'm going to add confuse. Confuse us from the purpose God has us on. Confuse us from the vision that he's given us. Confuse us from the role and the position he's put you in. Don't be confused. We are kings and queens heirs, you feel me? Kings and queens heirs. Y'all, that's dope. We are leaders. This is who we are. We are servants. This is who we are. So don't be confused. I think you are anything less because you are not. You are not. And so they combated that by praying day and night, day and night. And when we get to it, the last portion of this is there was care again. Jude, uh, one of the leaders, Judah, uh, mentioned in Nehemiah that their strength was, was failing. Um, and there was so much rubbish. Again, we only got half the wall built. You know, they may not be able to finish, you know. And don't forget, they got all this mockery coming on, on, on every side. Um, and so what happened was Nehemiah, okay, I'm guessing he prayed on his lonesome or whatever, but he went straight to the preparation part. <laughs> he said, okay, get my men positioned. He put men at the top and men at the low valleys. He had men over here and men over there. But most importantly, this is what he did, y'all. This is what he did, and I love this. This is what he did. This is what he did. This is what he did. They had bricks in one hand, and they had their weapons in the other. So they were ready. So let me read you these verses, and then we're going to get up out of here, Okay. It says uh, in chapter 4, verse 17 through 18, those who built on the wall, so those were all the Jews, and those who carried burdens, all the Jews, loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, and with the other they held a weapon. Every one of the builders, the saints, the believers, the leaders, the people that could hear the sound of my voice, had his sword, his or her sword, girded at his side. As he built, as he worked, as he built God's kingdom, they were ready to rejoice in the faithfulness of God, but also to fight the, fear, the, the, the fleshly war we are in every single day. You all, they were building God's kingdom, literally the temple, the, the, the wall, while ready for battle every second of every day. They were building and they were ready for battle. They were building and they were ready for battle. This is how we are to stand. With the truth and the faithfulness of God in one hand, and the truthful faithfulness of God in the other hand, one to rejoice and to build, the other to fight off the enemy that will and is coming. Are y'all with me or are you not? The visual of this, excuse me, the visual of this, woo! I'm just like, yes, God, come on with it. So like he empowered his leaders with that. Like, no, we're ready. They can circle around us, do whatever they want to do. They can say what they want to say. We ready. We got what we need. We got our weapons, but most, most importantly, we got our God. And we're going to keep building this wall. We're going to keep building into the kingdom, even if we don't see everyone show up to church the way we want to. We're going to keep building into yeah, the kingdom. Yeah. You know, even if the family isn't right where we think they should be, we're going to keep building into the kingdom. Even if the school board doesn't want us to do this, or the school is doing that, or the community is doing this, or my mother said this, or my father. No, we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Ready for the war that's going to come. But most importantly, ready to be about God's business. Last but not least, like I told you, we are Nehemiah. We are the Nehemiah of our lifetime. Believers are leaders for the building of the kingdom and the war of the flesh, in season and out of season, under attack and when the wall is complete. Remember, the wall fell three times. So we may complete the wall now, but there's something else in my head to knock it down. And we got to stay ready and be ready. Okay? So I just want to remind you all that. I want to thank you for your time because I know I'm way over, but it was so good to me. You all are leaders and you all are called to be consistent. So God bless you, okay? <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. We are.
are the Nehemiahs. Uh, a portion of the wall is yours to build. Huh? It's not what somebody else is doing, what they're doing. Who's doing my part? The Georgia Church open. God has called us to leadership and whatever you're trying to do, if you're smart, the, the first thing you'll do is get God in. Allow God to sponsor you in what you're doing. Uh, allow God to cover you. Yeah. Allow God to equip you. And when God is in it and on your side, you can't lose. If you trust the results to him. See, if I, if I just do what God tells me to do, then the results are on him. If I'm just obedient and realize that all that I am, I'm not all of that, and that God is able to use me for his honor, his glory, and that I can get my part of the ball done. Yeah. We see that now in your third room. If this message, being a consistent leader, not wake up every other week and say, well, you know what, I think I'll go to church today. Yeah. But part of my, part of my lifestyle yeah. is on certain times I pray. And, and, and part of my lifestyle is certain times I worship. And part of my makeup is getting God into everything I'm into. And if God can't be there, then I don't need to be there either. Consistency. Not how we feel depending on what's going on. But I'm consistent. Amen. We thank God for this word today. Amen. We thank God for the care. You know, and if, you, if you're a leader, the, the, I love that word, care. And, and, and care is not just a, a physical thing. It's a hard thing, too. Because if, if the hard thing's not there, then the other part won't, won't happen. May we stand? Father God, we thank you for this day. For this word, we thank you. For this young lady, we thank you. Bless her. Bless those who receive this word, Lord, that it might take it and go back over the notes and learn thereby. We pray that you would bless us to be here again and to fellowship, dear Lord, and to meet you, dear Lord, to honor you and to bless your name. And now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit Rest with and abide with each of you. Henceforth, not forevermore. Amen. Thank you.